Hi, Mitch and Carl. I'm so excited to have you both together here at Rendering Unconscious Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here and good to see you, Mitch. It's been a while since we were in live uh, communication. Always good. It has been a while. You're two of my favorite humans in two dimensions and three dimensions. I hope to see you in three dimensions soon. Absolutely. Yes. I'm coming to New York in May, but Carl's not coming with me, but I'll be there. Oh, we're going to start a Get Carl to New York campaign. So. <laughs> uh, hashtag. Right. We'll work on that. Okay. Yeah. That would be fun. Well, we'll see. We'll see. It's been six years, which is kind of wild. Long, yeah. Man. Absolutely crazy. Crazy. We were all going to be together for a book signing you guys were doing at Mast Books in the East Village, but the pandemic made short work of that, unfortunately exactly exactly that was uh scheduled and uh, we had to cancel it was only about a week before i think and then jen died uh just so it was very very sad times yes it mm -hmm. is i recall that week vividly genesis pure mm -hmm. died uh, at home on the lower east side of manhattan where i was living at the time and uh, jacqueline uh castell my partner uh, was one of the first people to go to the apartment. And at that time, the lockdown was just underway and none of us had any idea the global changes that were occurring. It was a, mm -hmm. it was a somber, sad week. Mm -hmm. Indeed, indeed. Well, we, we're uh, lucky to say that we've come a long way since then and that's mm -hmm. great. And it's been, you know, crazy turmoilish times, although most often kind of subdued. I can feel very distinctly that my mind frame has uh, changed. I would say to the greatest part, it's, it's like, you know, for the better. Uh, yeah. But uh, for instance, we are about to embark on a tiny journey soon next week. We're going to to Prague to this, uh, the ending of Jan's show there, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's basically the first time uh, I'll be traveling since or we'll be traveling since the summer of 22 when we went to France and actually got COVID. Yeah, uh, that's the only that... time we've been on a plane since COVID started and we got COVID and then we're just yeah. like, get it. <laughs> and before that, you know, it, before that was, uh, you know, we were, we were traveling so much, you know, and I've always been traveling and now there have been actually, you know, full years without me traveling. So I have changed in that sense. Uh, and again, mostly for the for the better, I think. Uh, I've become very, very sensitized. It's not that I dread traveling, uh, mm -hmm. but I do, I'm more aware of the things involved. And, and um, you know, maybe um, it's it's an age thing also. I don't know. I just feel very comfortable here. And uh, of course, you know, of course we'll travel again, but uh, yeah, I'm not the same globetrotter as I used to be. Yeah, you used yes. to be somewhere like every month. Yes. <laughs> I've noticed this among a lot of people. I was speaking to my friend, Dean Radin, who is of course a great researcher of ESP and psychical abilities. And Dean is very in demand as a speaker, rightly in demand. But he explained to me sort of, as you were just saying, Carl, that increasingly he's he's really just very happy to be home out West and does most of his talks over Zoom and so forth. And it's it's an interesting cycle. It's changed our economy. It's changed our culture. It's, it's changed our city. Um, I, uh, I'm not sure how it's all going to spill out, whether a rising generation will retake to traveling. I feel very strongly, I'm not in any way interested in social or political prognostication, but it's very difficult not to feel that a, a whole change is afoot in our world at this moment. You know, historians very often observe, and I think rightly, that the 19th century really didn't end until the First World War. It was the First World War that commenced the 20th century. And many historians also say, I think less rightly, that the 20th century ended with the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall. I'm not entirely sure that's right. It feels like the 20th century is ending right now. Um, the changes that have been brought about worldwide culturally through the lockdown, uh, the wars in uh, the Middle East and, and in Ukraine, and the realignment in the United States, with Trump being a very likely victor for the upcoming presidential election, we're really seeing the commencement of the 21st century right now, it seems to me. And we may or may not like it, but I, I do believe that, that there's a page turning. 
Mm. I, I agree, absolutely. And I think uh, we're talking about uh, uh, centuries, you know, meaning a hundred years. And I think that uh, in, it's interesting that uh, our, our pandemic, so so the so-called this like uh, a centennial of the previous one, you know, the Spanish flu and stuff like that. It's almost like uh, that's, as you say, the real centennial, the real shift. Yes. And I, I, I don't mean to sound a depressing note or anything like that, but um, and I don't mean this in a negative way. I'm just talking among friends. My faith in human nature has probably never been lower. I, I have almost no faith in human nature, aside from a very small handful of deeply sensitive people who you find in any mob. In any mob, you find people who aren't throwing things, who aren't yelling, uh, who maybe have a fineness of emotion, and they're not interested in uh, targeting someone or, or burning someone at the stake. But I look on social media, for example, never a place to look when you're in the uh, mood to cheer yourself up. Um, and I see, for example, that, um, and this is just one errant example that's of deep personal interest to me, but one could choose, it's one among hundreds that any any thinking person could come up with. I look at um, the manner in which all this nonsense about the satanic panic in Europe and the United States was discredited. 30 plus years ago. And yet these same tropes and themes are coming up online. And I was just seeing just this morning, uh, you all are familiar with one of our fellow seekers, um, Damien Eccles. You know, Damien was, along with two of his friends, was falsely and horribly accused of uh, committing a homicide with which they had nothing to do. Um, uh, they fought for years uh, to to proclaim their innocence. Uh, uh, DNA evidence, among many, many other things besides, has established their innocence. Uh, Damien was on um, death row. Hard to believe. Since Freed. Uh, and there are people online still repeating these these tropes that the he and the, the West Mem so-called West Memphis Three uh, we're guilty of, of homicide and, you know, you can't find a more airtight case of absolute innocence and justice denied. You simply can't. And yet, um, people s keep going back to that trough. They just keep going back to that trough. And I cite that not because it's of personal interest to me, which it certainly is, but as a parable of how desperately lacking human nature is, how desperately lacking the capacity to to reason, to think, to express empathy, to express solidarity, to choose uncertainty over spite. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I have no uh, particular hope for the human situation uh, because of that. And the only hope that I find, if I find any, is in gatherings like this one where there are small numbers of colleagues who do care and are feeling people and who are, don't seek self-validation through uh, destruction. Mm -hmm. No, I, I absolutely hear you and totally agree. Uh, over the years, um, since you and I are working in uh, very similar fields, in very similar ways, I'd say, meaning outside of academia with very open minds, I would say mm -hmm. we're both really smart and really <laughs> nice people. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> but however, you know, I think that, that um, what I've come across, and I, I think I would like to ask you about that, <clears throat> it's an almost like Jungian notion. You know, thinking specifically about the collective unconscious. You know, why is it that we have so much magic around us? And by that, I mean not so much our personal magic uh, experience, but you know, tangential, manifested in popular culture, in the occult culture, uh, also in um, as you've been writing about. You know, uh, many people. Uh, becoming visible, uh, spreading ideas. Some are thousands of years old. Some are, you know, groundbreaking and new. However, mm -hmm. people are uh, offering um, alternative ways of looking at the world and their own lives uh, to an extent that we've never really seen before. And in part, mm -hmm. it has with the possibility, you know, technology and social media, so it's more visible than it ever could have been 100 years ago. That's a no-brainer. But on the other hand, there seems to be a, quite a lot of signal too, even if we don't as individuals resonate with that signal or that signal, we have our own preferences and aesthetics and all that stuff. But 
uh, I'm very happy that that's the case, that there is an overflowing of uh, opportunities, alternatives, routes to go uh, for people to, to suss out what their resonance is. And in my mind, I do think, I really believe that there is some kind of collective unconscious thing going on, saying that we're in such dire straits on a planetary level that we have to, as little, you know, worker ants in a way of uh, fairly high intelligence, we have mm. to, you know, change the direction we're going. And perhaps this is the way to do it. Or mm -hmm. perhaps we need an absolute collapse. Perhaps we need an apocalypse. I hope not. But that seems to be the case that uh, things are exponentially moving uh, towards a very dark place, a very dark corner from which we may not even be able to escape. Uh, but I'm, I'm just curious if you sort of feel the same way that the reason why there is so much magic, for instance, why Mitch is there writing about that stuff and why I'm here you know, uh, writing about stuff and many other people too, to an extent that's never been seen before. Yes. Well, I, I, I think of magic as a way of accessing a greater dimension of power in one's life. And certainly um, your book, um, A Culture, among other things that you've written, helped me clarify um, with uncompromising self-honesty that the thing I'm seeking in my search, we all love to talk about truth and understanding and so forth, I'm seeking power. If I find within that truth and understanding, as I certainly hope to, good, but but that's what's bringing me to the to the threshold. And I think for people who feel, as many people do, certainly here in the Western world, I'm sure in other parts of the world, their lives are absolutely out of control, um, that can be an attractive possibility. Uh, one of the things I'm interested in and that I wanted to ask both of you about is the uh, inconsistency of magic. We've all had sufficient experience in our lives, I think this is true certainly of all three of us, it's certainly true of most of your, your viewers, to feel that magic is a warranted path. But my experience has also been one of inconsistency. Something extraordinary happens and then nothing happens or a remarkable truth comes through some, let's say, divinatory method or oracle. And then next time out or, or three times later, um, nothing of particular value seems to come through. How do, you, how do you, I'd like to know how you both understand that in your practice, what your experiences have been with that, is it a crisis? Is it just innate to the to the art? How do you how do you see it? <clears throat> I've started looking well, at it more as like a long term unfolding process because now it's been like enough years or decades or whatever that I can start seeing like how things unfolding now. Like we're starting like you know ten years ago or fifteen years ago or even thirty years ago that I didn't realize or intend. So I'm realizing that like a lot of my magic is like sort of unconscious in that mm. it's not, I'm not really doing what I think I'm doing consciously, but I am like putting out intentions and then the intentions are unfolding, just not in the way that I imagined and not necessarily in a way that you could say like this caused this, but is more like this like larger unfolding process that's happened over time, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to tie it in with the, with the, my previous uh, uh, train of thought, in a way, this thing with, with the collective unconscious and things popping up because there's a need. I think even on the individual level, uh, if we talk about one specific magical uh, continual individ individuation process, uh, I think things pop up because there's a need for it. And if you do the same kind of ritual, for instance, over time, you will not be in the same mind frame each of those times. Mm. And it may not be resonant in the moment for what you need to you know, pull out of the rabbit's hat uh, uh, at that moment. And I think uh, it's the same thing with, uh, it might even be not instinctual. I was going to make a, a sort of a, a metaphor there. We like to eat when we're hungry, you know, and all these instinctual things. Uh, and then we go cook and then we eat and we're happy for it for a bit. Uh, and I think that whatever we need on a spiritual level or soul level or magical level, um, 
uh, it will make itself heard or announced we need mm -hmm. to deal with this thing and then again i think that's the reason i mean vanessa is a psychoanalyst and i'm very interested in the process and in psychology in general you know why we do what we do you know why do we do what we do well you know you can say you know it's childhood etc cetera, etc cetera. but there's more to it than that and that's tying it in with the power concept again you know power is actually um an extraction from from the survival instinct you know mm -hmm. we need power why well essentially to survive and you know you have the biological progeny if you have kids and stuff like that also but it's all about being as powerful as you can be uh, for the for you know the time that you're alive mm -hmm. and I, I think that that um, one also a metaphor or an analogy or another system that's related very much to the magical path sometimes it crosses over and i'm thinking of the psychedelic you know uh, there used to be a lot of talk about that that wow i had such an amazing trip in the weekend and i had all of these insights and and really cosmic you know truths were revealed to me and then come monday morning you're back at work and sort of it fizzles <laughs> out because mm, the, yeah, culture, yeah. the culture that we're in is uh, maybe your little peer group can be happy and say, wow, I had a great time too. But we don't have any real tools, uh, culturally rooted tools to deal with this kind of epiphanic behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that um, uh, that's one of the important things that maybe this magical movement that's going on uh, can teach us basically to uh, value whatever we experience on the so-called inner planes whether you call it you know, mental emotional psych psychological basically on the inner side of yourself uh, that's all true then you can say that wow maybe that was just like a, a, a train that was a flight of fancy a compensatory kind of thing in a moment because i was angry and then i had an angry thought etc but it could also be deeper things having to do with where you're at in your individuation process and as long as that's not validated by the outer culture, by your peers, by your pa parents, the family, society as such, then of course you'll feel like an outsider or a, a freak or uh, maybe you will lose interest. And that's the worst thing when you give up on yourself and what your own experiences are. So I think that kinship with, with um, uh, let's call it psychedelic theory, psychedelic philosophy uh, can be very, very valuable uh, um, not only now but you know forwards also because so much of the at least the organic stimulants um, they carry wisdom from where they came from meaning from the ground from this kind of uh, holistic existence that we are absolutely a part of but our mm -hmm. thinking and feeling and willing has been uh, you know cut off abstracted uh, because of the culture we're in so I think that um, if we take that back to the specifically magical, uh, again, I think that um, whatever we do should be done in the spirit of experimentation. Repetition and rote becomes inertia. That's just like anything in life. And and uh, whatever comes in the moment, even if nothing comes, and by come, I don't mean necessarily external, like you know, angelic forces, demonic forces, whatever, just you know, from yourself to yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. should be listened to it's just like dreams you know dreams is an accepted language you see it as weird and symbolic whatever but the other ones you have when you're daydreaming or just fantasizing it's the same thing it's just a different language telling you about yourself things yes. you do need to hear at the moment so i think all of these it's uh, you know extra sensory uh, extra uh, extra conscious things are uh, they're all basically magic in the sense that they're part of your individuation process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean i, I think how i mean i think mish would love our origin story and i don't think he's heard it would mother have a safe trip it's so good oh, where is that just a minute don't no one move <laughs> <laughs> look at this oh look wow at... first yeah, edition exactly. yeah. right. like there. can we tell him of course Okay, do you want to start since you wrote the book? Absolutely. And you're referring to, to what happened in 2013. Our origin story. You're right, exactly. Well, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I had a book launch for that when it came out uh, at around Halloween 2013 at mm -hmm. Cat Lab. You know, the old school It's Cat important, Lab. October 30th, because the dates are important and they repeat. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and um, it was a, you know, um, very lovely evening. I was uh, very happy to be there. I had my daughter with me and and nice people there in the store and just very, very pleasant. And I had worked with Jan earlier in the day. And I think the day before also on the documentary Change Itself, they're mm. shooting stuff at the at the apartment there. And, and um, so I was hoping that Jan would uh, come, uh, but uh, Jan didn't feel well. Um, but there were many other people, uh, including Vanessa. You know, Vanessa mm -hmm. came. That was the first time we met. And I signed her book, uh, Enjoy Irresponsibly. Uh, and <laughs> that was that, you know. And later on in the evening, uh, Jen called me and said, you know, sorry, I couldn't come, et cetera, et cetera. But that's fine. And what I didn't know at the time was that Vanessa and Jen were in a relationship. And mm -hmm. Jen had actually read the book. And we were I sitting in bed reading before. your book together. Yeah. <laughs> so that was amazing to hear and then of course um we did the psych art cult the conference things and and basically fell in love over uh, after we had really started planning for the first conference in london in 2016 okay and then uh, basically when we had been in a relationship uh we had gotten married uh, moving vanessa over to sweden stuff like that it took some time you know red tape bureaucracy and then um when we were in egypt at the temple of hatshepsut uh we got a call from the swedish embassy in washington calling vanessa for this very important interview that you have to do if you want to um uh, get a residency permit the whole reason you wrote the book mother yeah. have a safe trip Carl yeah. put spells in there to like, <laughs> like, let me bring in my lady love. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like they were in the book. And then he recited mm -hmm. those spells in a cave in Macedonia to kind of give them extra. Oomph. Yeah, to make, make a reality out of fiction anyway. But what happened was that that um, uh, we Vanessa did the interview and then we uh, basically... Uh, got the message in Washington that everything had been approved. So so all of this happened on the same date, you know, just five years. On October after we had 30th, five years yeah. later, exactly, from 2013 yeah, yeah. to 2018. And that's when I was yeah. like, whoa, Carl's level of magic is like next level. <laughs> There's a whole dimension to life and it doesn't mm. know time and it doesn't know it and and it 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 springs itself on us at such extraordinary moments. And I, I, I've been thinking a lot lately about the workings of, of time and the certainties that we all feel around linearity because it's so overwhelmingly persuasive, even though we know it's only conceptual, it's not ultimate. And um, I've been suggesting to others and experimenting myself with what is sometimes called retro causality. In other words, continuing your efforts uh, after the fact. And people have had very interesting results with it. Uh, retro causality is something that I've written a lot about recently because there were experiments now going back over a decade at Cornell University, which themselves lasted for a decade in which the parapsychologist Daryl Bem experimented with improved cognition by studying for a test after the fact. And he did find continually spikes in cognition, um, slight but statistically very significant. And his results have since proved confirmatory in a large meta-analysis, which consisted of 90 labs, I'm sorry, which consisted of 90 separate trials, including the originals, um, at 33 different labs in 14 different nations. And people say, well, parapsychology proves non-replicable in its results. Of course, the results are more replicable than those found behind most of our most popular pharmaceutical drugs. <laughs> and um, retrocausality based on statistical evidence is a reality. So I always encourage people to try little experiments with it. We've had experiments over cognition, one could try experiments over athletics, for example, physical performance in general. A uh, a woman 
approached me a couple of weeks ago, a friend, and she was applying for a job and she really needed this job and she really wanted it. And she was looking for methods to help things along. Well, the verdict came in and she didn't get it. And she was naturally very, very disappointed. Uh, and I encouraged her to keep on doing whatever it was that she had been doing leading up to her prep for the interview. Just try it, keep doing it, keep doing it. A week passed and the interviewer approached her again and said, well, guess what? There's been a change in plans and now we want to offer you the job. Now, you know, there's there's 10,000 different reasons why that could have happened, but the correlation is too enticing to not continue experimenting. So I'm super interested in how even what we're discussing at this very instant could have a retrocausal effect, could reach backwards, so to speak, as we understand it, and define your story of union, your story of meeting. We, we're, we're so attached to the, the certainty of linearity. Well, this is what happened back then, and well, crazy times, right? But it, it's entirely possible that present perceptions and efforts affect what happened so-called back then in extraordinary ways. Mm. So we should all be careful, be very thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely gentle towards one another <laughs> you know because because time it, 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 as a thing is much more sensitive than we understand and of course einstein spoke about space time differences between perceived perceived dualities between time and space erasing when an object is moving fast enough and einstein's theories have been proven they, they're no longer theories i mean these are proven facts of our physical existence and they're bizarre and they're extraordinary much more so than anything that shows up in any book of magic and absolutely and, and it behooves us to to experiment with these things if if einstein mm. is correct about the time space distinction erasing it, it it throws into question everything everything including what we think of as the past being demarcated from the present um, what happened to you two is absolutely real, but it, it could be resulting from what's happening right now, mm. as opposed to what happened so-called back then. You know what I mean? Mm, absolutely. And if nothing else, it has changed our mind frame a little bit just talking about it, whether we are aware of it or not. And I think one key to, to uh, this thing, and I was just you know, thinking about this also when you talked about Einstein, I'm, I'm sure actually Einstein is like, old hat today i'm sure they oh, yeah. moved on in their thinking and even more far out things but anyway i think the, the key to a lot of uh things having to do with our own experience of magic is in moments of transcendence and it's not a speculative thought from me it's just you know going back to the roots with shamanic journeying trans states uh, all these kinds of things it's absolutely part and parcel the quintessential key to um, learning new things. You know, you have to transcend the old, even if it's just for a little moment. And and I think that um, time, as you say, how can we transcend that? Well, we could see it as malleable. And then we drift into the pot potential criticism from others saying, well, you're just making up fantasies, you know, but so what? Because <laughs> I think there's, a, there's another possible transcendence here that is very, very, very important and also very magical. Uh, and I talked about that at a kind of a retreat we were at last summer, um, uh, which I, you know, talked about dreams and this thing. Uh, dreams are not only the sleep dreams, the oneric, you know, it could also be daydreams and fantasies, stuff like that. Usually they come from a, a, a need, you know, a compensatory need to uh, uh, actually see and experience and feel an ideal scenario as opposed to what you're in right now that's causing the frustration. But as we talked about those psychedelic experiences and other things, you know, if we don't have the tools to harness them and deal with them and look at them, they just fizzle out, you know, until it's time for another fantasy. However, if we think about the fantasy as for what it is and, and uh, analyze it, we write about it as uh, we are recommended to do by many sage, you know, wise people, then it's moved. The thing, the cluster is moved from the unconscious and also from the conscious into memory. Uh, 
And yes. memory is a completely different thing that is part of our assessing reality. Yes. So that that way we have transcended uh, what was like an urge or an emotional comp compensatory need uh, to thinking about it rationally in the moment, but also this is important. I'll think about it some more. And by taking that rational step to process it some more, we move it into our memory. I can remember that yesterday I thought about my dream. I didn't just make a little note in my diary. I actually thought about my dream and thereby I moved it via the rational into the memory and I can now access it again. And hopefully I won't become demented, but right now, uh, it's available as a different kind of source of information that is mine and mine, but it comes from a, an unknown place, uh, but now it's known. So I think that's a very important um, example of the why transcendence is so important. You know, why we have to go from one mind frame to another and be aware that we're doing it uh, and validate all of these things as potential bringers of useful information yes yes it seems to me that so many of our beliefs you were referencing critics who will claim that a certain belief system is just fantasy to which your response brilliantly is so what you know but that's like saying water is wet you know it's 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 <laughs> this is our this is part of the makeup of our psyche of our existence um it seems to me that so many of our beliefs belong to what might be considered the bastard offspring of the wish for power, which is simply the wish for safety. And more and more as I encounter people, their beliefs, my beliefs, whether they're about mundane things, whether they're about things that seem very impactful, are all constructed upon the wish for safety. So to the ardent materialist, for example, whose beliefs are total fantasy that have since been... Um, that have been discredited, you know, countless times within our uh, scientific model, the notion that all of life arises from, well, that essentially that life creates itself, that life is strictly a chemical process and that there's nothing non-local, there's nothing beyond flesh and bone. And um, when, it's, when it's gone, it's like the water evaporated in a glass, everything is gone. Of course, that doesn't stand up to even mo some of the most basic rudiments of our science, not only going back to, to Einstein, but 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 going back to Newton and, and in fact, extending up to the present day in terms of studies of neuroplasticity. But this fantasy of materialism um, is profoundly important to the <clears throat> purveyor of it. And he or she will grow very emotional very quickly when it's challenged. Likewise, my fantasies. Um, we we search for for safety in these things and the same is true of politics of course i see here in the united states um any number of celebrities will rush out to get in front of political causes or movements and organizations feel that they have a need to state a position paper on something and it seems to me as if our point of view on social matters on political matters um, these things are formed very, very, very early in life. Um, this is kind of Vanessa's territory. You know, we we arrive at these opinions um, so early, I think, as as little as kids that we're not even able to fully classify our, our points of view or ourselves vis-a-vis -vis those points of view. But we feel a sense of rightness about certain things, which I would venture has something to do with safety. And I don't think any uh, position, endorsement, or event in the world changes those those points of view ever. Uh, people like to speak of their intellectual evolution, but the truth is they probably believe today what they believed in one form or another when they were three or four years old in the playground. And all they're doing is just extrapolating these points of view to an election, to a war, to a this, to a that. And they think it's some great moral genesis, but I think it's just a... Um, Again, I, I shouldn't be too general. Obviously, there are people who have small, small numbers of people, I, I would reckon, who 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 have a fineness of, of intellect, a fineness of emotion that does allow perhaps for some degree of growth. But most of the time, I think we're, we're out for safety and we're extrapolating our childhood points of view, our maybe even infancy points of view onto larger 
um, seemingly larger issues. Um, we've left the playground, you know. Now Absolutely. And then I think, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think also it, it's uh, uh, many people forget or tend to forget that we're just uh, accumulations of history. And I'm thinking specifically of DNA. You know, we are, we have our little program called DNA and we come from mommy and daddy and, you know, countless generations. Um, and that's, of course, very interesting and very magical because uh, there's this sort of, it's not a dichotomy or a dilemma even. It's just like, you know, where in this is our sentience? You know, where is where are we <laughs> in this pool of, of genetics? Uh, is it something that travels along or is it just uh, haphazard or random or whatever? Uh, I, I don't think we can ever really know. Maybe we'll, someone will know in the future. But it's interesting to me that um, um, the, the concept of safety in numbers uh, mm -hmm. Because, as you say, you know, we're after, you know, surviving and power and, and uh, man is uh, is a social animal, uh, but it's also we need not only for, for you know, for fun and social uh, games, we also need each other to be able to, to survive because our societies and cultures are so complex, you know, I can't do all the things that everyone else can do. So we work right. together and pay taxes to, to, <laughs> to, to make it work. Um, but at the same time, I do believe that uh, the people you refer to as, uh, uh, well, the, the odd ones out in a way, I wonder if they, you call them fine, I think, fine in their sensibilities. Uh, and I wonder if, if there isn't something there about um, that those people are also more honest, because uh, honesty has no place in the safest of environments, if it's all based on a lie, we can, yes. you know, have totalitarian societies and you know dictatorships and horrible things where things are actually functioning, you know, uh, but people are paranoid, they're afraid, they're harassed, uh, in, or it could be like some some um, self censorship scenario uh, in an Orwellian sense. And uh, I think that's that's the biggest challenge in uh, in the individuation process is to really harness and sort of um, care for and develop your own sense of honesty because mm -hmm. what happens if your honest the the end result of an analysis based on honesty comes to a point that uh, contradicts where you are yes <laughs> that's it's something it's like uh, for me it's almost um, like one of those uh, uh, again you know psychedelic trips and someone starts talking about you know where does the universe end, man? You know, and you go, wow, I can't think it. You know, it's like, it hurts. Right, right. right. <laughs> for, for me, it's the same thing. What happens if I am completely honest and, and sort of in the moment I say, no, I don't like this. But at the same time, I'm fully immersed in it. You know, what do you do? And I think most people, they do, you know, self-medication. They go with the flow. Uh, they go to yoga because everyone else is doing it. And they... Yes. they we are as human beings, you know, very much little worker ants, and and of course that's a great source of uh, frustration. And again, why I think there is so much, you know, a plethora of opportunities. And I don't personally don't care if they're there for you know uh, commercial reasons. I think the more opportunities there are for people to choose um, some kind of resonant path of self development, the better. And mm -hmm. and I do think that. Um, but even that can be a cul-de-sac, you know, even that can be, you know, a cul-de-sac that has really nice blinking lights that you like, you know, uh, ten easy steps, uh, we can take you through, here's an initiation, um, here's a retreat, you know, but there's no guarantee that that will be right for you. But then, of course, you have to go through it to, to realize yes. it. And, and yes. then, but not only that, you have to also be honest when you come come through to the other side and say that this was completely fucked up or this was wonderful. I'll carry on on that uh, path. But I think honesty is one of those uh, concepts that uh, we talk about too little, too seldom. Yes. And, and I want to add this with regard to honesty because it's such an important issue. You know, I, I think that People feel sometimes rightly, sometimes not, a profound sense of mistrust in in one another. That that 
what this individual is saying to me is concealing something much more sinister and much more threatening. And a lot of our arguments, especially on social media, proceed from that. It's it's I've been very influenced by the thought of G.I. Gurdjieff. And one of Gurdjieff's analyses of the human situation is that we have within us buffers that prevent us from seeing reality, including about ourselves, because if we saw the internal contradictions with which we live, we'd go mad. And so we're buffered off from permitting certain questions or impressions to enter. And um, Jacob Needleman, who died about 18 months ago, who was a student of the Gurdjieff work, also a big influence on me, um, used a wonderful example. And he found this example in a place that's very familiar to most people. There was a sociologist here in the United States named Stanley Milgram, and he did the famous or infamous Milgram experiments in the early 60s, where he would take um, a lab subject, just an everyday person who volunteered for the experiment or was being paid some small sum of money, and tell them that the person in the next room uh, had to answer certain basic questions. And if they answered incorrectly, uh, the subject could administer an electrical shock. And the man in the wet in the lab coat, also an actor, induced subjects to issue these electrical shocks up to the point of presumed death, where the person in the next room stopped screaming and was totally silent and was presumably dead. And then the experimenter brought down the curtain and said, well, you can relax. This has just been a innocent sociological experiment to demonstrate how all how inhuman we all are and everybody of course watches this and thinks tisk 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 isn't that a shame um but what jerry pointed out and this is so important and um it's hard to get this across to people jerry would show his students um films of the milgram experiment and would show these average likable everyday people shocking people to death according to their understanding and the experimenter would then say to the subject the one who was administering these shocks or believed he was why did you listen why didn't you object why didn't you refuse and jerry at that moment would freeze the film and say to students look at his face look at his face look at the subject's face the subject's face almost always had a blank expression he would start to look up or look away maybe reach for a cigarette and say, hey, look, you know, I was getting pretty worried there. And uh, You weren't asked if you were worried. You were asked why you administered the shock. They couldn't permit in the question. They couldn't permit in the question. So when we do things that are terrible, like unnecessary acts of violence to another person, we will not let in that question. It's too self-damaging. It would tear us apart. So our inability to be honest is not only innate, but it involves the inability to even hear the question. And it's a tough situation humanity is in. <laughs> Gurdjie felt that if one thinks cosmologically, as he put it, we are at a very disadvantageous place uh, in the cosmos, so to speak, if one wants to think in hermetic terms or Gurdjieffian terms. And our situation is really piss poor. And um, as, as Gurji felt, and as, as Jerry taught as well, we ask ourselves questions about being good, about honesty and so forth. And the, the individual in most cases can't even get to the point of grappling with such questions because we're totally buffered off from them, apropos of, apropos of myself, you know. Yeah, really? it's incredibly interesting um, and and sort of depressing too, <laughs> because yeah, uh, people will do things that um, they wouldn't like to have done to themselves. So yeah. it's weird. And can't even permit yeah. in the question. You know, even as mm. I'm describing this, I'm saying to myself, you know, the Milgram experiments, for all their genius, to a degree, and this is not the fault of the experimenter at all. Mm -hmm. To a degree, these things almost do us more harm than good in the sense that everybody who watches that thinks, well, I'm one of the good guys. I sure wouldn't yeah. do that. Whereas that's not even the point, you know. Yeah. It's all of us. It's all of us. Yeah. That's just yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, uh, I just uh, picked out today on certain places, your book of essays and also the Modern Occultism book. And, you know, you're so incredibly productive. 
And and first of all, I was just curious, you know, what you're working on right now. And also, uh, are you still finding stuff that's uh, that gets you going? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, that's the key question. What am I finding that gets me going? I do find that right now at this juncture in my life, I'm very interested in ideas that are actionable. I'm really, really interested in ideas that are actionable. I'm interested in accelerants, I find. Um, are there things that help the individual get over a certain barrier? For some people, an accelerant might be psychedelics. I haven't experimented too much with psychedelics myself, but for another person, it might be transcendental meditation. I'm very interested in this practice of sex transmutation, which was explained with great aplomb in the work of Napoleon Hill and was embraced by William Burroughs and other people I admire and which I use myself. Uh, I'm very, very interested in the question of accelerance um, in terms of the human situation, in terms of the search uh, for power or the search to understand something about self. Um, if I find that in someone's work, I'm immediately aroused and impassioned and I want to I want to go all the way into it. If I don't find that, I, I, I probably get lost and I move on to something else. Um, in terms of what I'm working on right now, this coming Thursday night begins the first session of a six part course I'm doing for the Theosophical Society called Icons of Modern Esoterica, which starts with Madame H.P. Blavatsky, our great modern sphinx, our great Rorschach of the modern era. Everyone sees in her whatever they want to see in her, whatever they're most in love with or fearful of, probably in themselves, they project onto Madame Blavatsky. <laughs> I almost think that's what she was there for, the an egregore yeah. that we've created, you know. Yeah. And, um, and I have a new book coming out next month in March called Happy Warriors, which is uh, consists of biographical chapters of the different founders of the positive thinking movement. And I'm always very interested in the response that people have to that kind of work because we as a culture have been taught to believe that positive thinking is sort of a refrigerator magnet philosophy for dummies. And, you know, it's something that you find on your grandmother's nightstand, not something that really warrants the attention of a serious thinking person. And yet, Many of these founders, they 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 had tremendous instincts for human nature, both magically, psychologically, even I would say even biologically. They foresaw certain advances that we wouldn't realize until generations later when we had brain scans and fields like neuroplasticity. And sometimes one finds a congruity in the language that some of these people used in the late 19th, early 20th century with language that one now finds in neuroscience. It's really remarkable. This was, of course, decades before not only the popular popularization of, of quantum theory, but before even in some cases the inception of quantum theory. And some of these figures had remarkable instincts, which they popularized. And I often say that movement the positive mind movement, New Thought, did a better job of popularizing than of refining itself. Hence, it, it grew very stunted. And we need to ask if those of us who care about that movement, as I do, want to use it, want to consider it something workable rather than just a museum exhibit, difficult, difficult questions need to be asked because the presence of tragedy in a person's life is absolutely inescapable. And if that doesn't abrogate new thought, then what does it do to it? And what does that say? So I try to get into the guts of these people's lives, probably as a, as a means of forwarding my own search. But they did have, many of them had truly, truly remarkable and interesting lives. And um, wherever they wound up, some people wound up in places that perhaps seemed happy and satisfying, others that seemed tragic and arid, but they, they did have a search and I want them to be more fully understood. So Happy Warriors is a book that attempts to put the lives of these positive mind theorists under the microscope and say, hey, was there something there? Like Norman Vincent Peale, for example, who wrote Power of Positive Thinking, he was agonized that he was held up as a kind of dunce in the intellectual culture and still is today considered a total dunce. But he did have a very rich intellectual life. He also had a gift 
that maybe overshadowed his intellect, which was he, he had a gift for, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but he had a gift for glibness. He had a gift for taking a metaphysical principle he believed in and reducing it to a homily, which made him very, very popular, but also made him very suspect among intellectuals who eviscerated him. There was a lot of pain in his life because of that, and he hid that pain. Um, there was also a lot of foolishness in his life. Uh, but he did remarkable things as well. In this country, at least, he de destigmatized, he helped destigmatize visiting a therapist. In 1937, Peel and a colleague of his opened a religio psychiatric clinic here in Manhattan. And the notion in those days, I mean, pre war, if you were seeing a shrink, you know, you were either nuts or you were some sort of bohemian avant gardist or something. You know, no one went to see therapists except for, you know, communists or lunatics. And, uh, <laughs> And, and Peel helped destigmatize that. So there was a richness in the guy's life. I, I simply won't write him off for all the things about him that I found distasteful, especially later in his career. He deserves to be considered as a human being. So that's what I try to do in Happy Warriors. I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. That's a great title, too. Thank you. Uh, I, was I, think... I was originally going to call, forgive the interruption, my book, One Simple Idea, which is a history of the positive mind movement. I was originally going to call that Happy Warriors. I was dissuaded from that by grand poobahs of the publishing world. Um, but I was always uncomfortable with it. So now I'm reclaiming the title. Yeah, no, that's great. I think maybe maybe uh, one uh, one reason why that area, I mean, it's we could say it's an area, of course, there are many different thinkers under that umbrella uh, of, uh, well, positive thinkers or whatever you want to call them. And then the fact that uh, they stress that so much, you know, efficiency and happiness, la da da. Uh, for most people in our culture, in the Western culture, we do have a kind of a dualistic thinking. So mm. if someone stresses something, we immediately think that oh, they're trying to shy away from the other thing, you know, yes. from, from from the opposite. But that's not always the case. I think that's very rarely the case. Just because you know. Um, it's like with sports, you know, you can have your favorite team, but that team needs someone to play against. Yes, know? right. And, and, a, and a league of many, many things. Uh, so, yeah, no, I find it fascinating also uh, in the same way that I can find certain aspects of, uh, I would say, Dianetics more than Scientology, you know, because it, so much of it makes sense when you read it and it's sort of, you know, uh, it's all about, you know, improvement and, uh, you know, efficiency and stuff like that uh, without the structures that came later and all the sort of, mm, I don't know, quite dubious techniques and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. But there's there's always something in something. I remember at some point I was presented with um, uh, something that I thought I would never really be interested in, uh, but I found it interesting that I was married Baker Eddy. Mm -hmm. uh, in in the sense that you know well you know me you know my background and the sort of going through these you know fairly dark systems and and you know um i love satan you know this kind of thing and and then uh, i can't remember who who talked about it anyway i i was given a book um some kind of anthology and i did find it very interesting because i was also at that time thinking about uh not being sort of anti-material in any any way or even dualistic but i was wanting to go more into you know the mind and that kind of uh, free floating ideas and sort of uh, not bogged down by material issues in a way and i yeah. found, found it very very stimulating and i'm sure again you know if you just uh, if you are open-minded you will find something useful in everything that's something yeah. I really loved about LaVey also. He was truly pragmatic. Um, yes. You know, he acknowledged that uh, uh, on TV even, it's unlikely things that there's been so much beautiful culture in the name of God. You know, I think many diehard Satanists would have a hard time, you know, did he really say that? Yeah, he did. <laughs> because yes. he loved take for instance you know and also you know uh being able to juggle this thing of being kind of like a, a zionist in in one way because of of uh friends and relatives he had and of course admiring ben hecht who was such an uh adamant zionist but at the same time weaving in stuff from aesthetics and uh, and some ideas and rituals from from the third reich and from from fascist Ooh, aesthetics and just making his own little 
candy bag of, of yes. stuff that made him tick. Anton has always fascinated me, and this is true of Genesis as well, because of their capacity to claim and rework the fascistic aesthetic. And we as a culture may hate ourselves for it, but we can't get away from it. We reprocess it through Darth Vader. We reprocess it through Loki. We reprocess it through Maleficent. And, you know, I've got all these people yelling at me online about how they hate Satanism. Well, what's your favorite movie? Oh, it's the Loki movie. Well, you know, come on, folks. You know, let's, let's, let's have a discussion here about digestion because we... We put these things into entertainment, and of course, the grand poobahs of the entertainment business brilliantly render, they understand, they understand as storytellers that every villain has to be sympathetic in order to not only attract the audience's attention, but to be part of a McDonald's Happy Meal. You know, you're simply not going to make Loki a Happy Meal at McDonald's. You have, you have Happy Meals in in Stockholm, don't you? Do you? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to be sure I, they weren't wondering what in God's name is Mitch talking about. <laughs> but anyway, we constantly reprocess these these archetypes through these softer forms of popular entertainment. And what Anton and Genesis did brilliantly, and others uh, in addition to them, is they they took and they reclaimed these things as personal symbols. So you know, this was Anton's. I don't know if it'll show up quite well. This was Anton's personal symbol here. You know, the lightning yeah. bolt, and that aesthetic is so powerful. And Anton wrote an essay, which is now anthologized in one of the collections that Feral House uh, put out about how the, the Jewish Nazi aesthetic, some sort of hybrid of that, is what the future um, belonged to. And of course, I'm incapable of standing in front of a mirror and disputing that. But, you know, we, we this aesthetic statement that, that, that Anton made and that Genesis made is, 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 it's, it's difficult to define and analyze because it's very attractive and it's very appealing. And they realized that. And I don't think they were on some cheap political trip of like, well, we're going to reclaim it and we'll show the bad guys. It wasn't that. It wasn't that exactly. I think it was probably acknowledging that all of occultism, to some degree, is a process of reclamation, reclamation. And to the extent that the fascist movements borrowed and clipped from the occult catalog, they were borrowing and clipping things that the uh, and 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 unmooring things from their meanings, both ancient and modern, that the that the occultists, like Madame Blavatsky, for example, had already been working with uh, reclaiming, reintroducing, reestablishing. So. Madame Blavatsky, of course, did so most famously with the Vedic image of the swastika, which I think proto-Nazis maybe, maybe got from her book, Secret Doctrine, or more likely knockoffs of Secret Doctrine. But that inception started with her. And when people detect an occult fascist connection, which I think is grossly overstated, what they're detecting is the 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 use of ancient heraldry, which was part of, which was part of and remains part of the occult project. But I think that um, Anton early in our culture, early in our culture, maybe Crowley did some of this too, but early in our culture, Anton really sensed the power of these symbols, but invited people, it seems to me, into a space of freedom where these symbols could be used without program or without program as had once been and i think we're still in the process of that experiment it's too early to say well it's about this it's about that we're finding out what it's about you know we're, we're seeing what it's about if people watching have no idea who any of us are and like some of what's being said join us in the experiment or go and attack us on you know twitter or whatever you wish but 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 we're seeing this experiment unfold which to me is exciting yeah, and I, think also in that, uh, yeah. I was gonna say uh that Mitch you did this interview that was in Counterpunch uh I don't know a month ago or so and that made its way through the psychoanalytic community like wildfire. I had so many people send me that interview and I was like, Yeah, I know Mitch. <laughs> that was cool. Now it's funny also I, I wanna talk this is a real non sequitur segue, so you have to be patient with me, but you know, Vanessa brought up counterpunch. I want to talk about how we as individuals value art and whether or not we're willing to pay 
pay for it. Counterpunch is sort of this uh, far left uh, uh, online journal. It was started by uh, Alexander Cobra, now deceased. He was the he was a columnist at the Nation magazine. Jeffrey St. Clair and some of his colleagues uh, continue running the thing today. Um, this interview that Vanessa mentioned is paywalled, and you got to pay about five bucks a month to enter the paywall. I I run into extraordinary numbers of people who to whom you know you know, they take it with great umbrage that anything should be paywalled anywhere, even though they profess to have uh, left-wing values or what have you. And even though here in New York City, $5 won't, literally will not buy you a coffee and a buttered roll. Um, and, um, and yet people don't want to pay for stuff like that. Whatever it is that they're into, whatever it is that they're into, it, the subject is irrelevant. I'm I'm concerned with the degree to which our digital culture has persuaded everyone that um, every art should be free. Every art should be free, um, whether it's collages that Vanessa does, or writing that Carl does, or some interview, or picture, or song. And um, I'm very struck by that. I'm very struck by the depth of hypocrisy that one finds where everybody claims to want to support indie businesses and independent countercultural expressions and all that jazz. And, uh, and yet nobody wants to pay for a goddamn thing. Uh, maybe I'm just complaining, but I want no, to no, know, but this your... podcast is a perfect example because, you know, my podcast has been on for six years now and Carl and I have 75 patrons and we are very grateful for the 75 patrons and we love every single one. Thank you for being there. But my podcast gets like, thousands and thousands and thousands of listens a week like thousands of listens a day sometimes you know and like we have 75 patients and then there's one podcast for example that's about psychoanalysis that started like last april and they have like 400 people why because they put their content behind the paywall you have to pay for it to listen to their show and i'm sitting here trying to like make psychoanalysis for everyone and spread it but like hey could you guys throw me two bucks and people don't isn't that something yeah it's fucked yeah. up <laughs> it's fucked up. It's fucked up. And look, you know, you want to know who you are? Uh, look at your look at your bank uh, statement. You know what what do what do I spend money on? Um, my internet bill could double in price tomorrow, and I would pay it. Uh, but do I spend that same amount of money on um, a picture or a song or something that somebody slaved to put together, which I claim to want to support? Um, we should really look at our bank balances. You know, it's another thing about Gurdjieff. And when I first read this, I was scandalized. In one of Gurdjieff's, in the introduction of one of Gurdjieff's books, maybe it was maybe it was called Life is Real Only Then When I Am. In any case, in the introduction of one of Gurdjieff's books, he wrote that at a certain point in his career, um, because of financial problems and just needing to physically rest, physical exhaustion. He disbanded the school that was around him for a period of time. And um, he needed a period of real downtime. And he said people would write him letters all the time, asking him questions, asking him for help with this or that. And he said, if he got a letter and there was money inside, he would respond to the question. And if there wasn't, he would immediately throw it away. And when I first read that as a young man, I thought, how cruel, how cold, how I'll never be interested in this guy, you know. But now, of course, looking back at the age of 58, I, I see entirely the good sense in it. I see entirely the good sense in it. Because not only should the querent be supporting the teacher or the practitioner or whomever he or she is asking a question of, but what what about the exchange? What about the exchange? You're asking him, might take him a half hour to respond to your letter very, very easily. He has to pay to send this letter back to wherever it's going. Not a thought for the person who's supplying that, not a thought. And now I realize, of course, that speaking of pragmatism, he was so clear and honest and pragmatic in doing that and writing about it and leaving himself perfectly open to a young person or an older person reading that and saying, that's so cruel. Well, the cruelty is the person who thinks that his time is free. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think I wanted to, to um, talk about that uh, pragmatism too. And it says that in, in one sense, it's about things that make you tick for whatever reason that you might not be even comfortable sharing. 
with other people. Then it becomes like a personal fetish in a way. And that's very beautiful. But I was also, while well, thinking about it, I came back to a term or a concept that I've found to be very, very wonderful because it has that taint of being almost forbidden, but it's also very beneficial, very nice. And it's the expression, guilty pleasures. You mm -hmm. know, it's a thing, you know, we, we talk about guilty pleasures and and uh, I would like to confess a guilty pleasure that that makes me feel good and relaxed and all kinds of things that maybe a year ago or longer ago, I wouldn't want it known that I had this guilty pleasure. <laughs> but, and and um, it's, we're now binge watching oh, Game of Game Thrones. Of Thrones. <laughs> we're, we're That's what we're gonna do when we hang up with late. you. <laughs> we binge I love it. <laughs> Game of Thrones. Oh, I haven't done that yet. I plan yeah, to. we just started and we're, we're already in like season four in like a week. <laughs> okay i dig yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it's and we could be i mean that's that's uh you know a streaming thing and you know that's what people do they watch these things and binge <laughs> watch and we do it a lot but again you know i have no problem with admitting or confessing that i enjoy it greatly uh whereas uh, if you had asked me five years ago or when this show was actually on you know uh, i would no, that's not for me I'm watching right. a documentary about French surrealism. Yeah. You know, or a four yeah, hour right. fucking Russian film or whatever you may be. Yeah, watching. exactly. In black and white. Yeah. I know. But, but uh, that's what I'm reading. Too. You know, I... <laughs> the question so, is, how it... honest am I going to be? You know? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that, yeah. that's the thing also. You know, uh, Lave was very honest about that. You know, these silly things and prankish toys and, and that kind of stuff. And, and Jen loved you know what he called the uh, airplane literature you know airport yes and only read biographies of people and also watch the history channel like ancient aliens and all these history things yes. all the time this is all we just <laughs> like lay in bed and watch this history channel mm -hmm. well here i'll um i'll i'll you know in the name of impromptu revelation you know just i took carl's book off the shelf i'll show you what i'm reading right now um uh Invoking the spirits, which yeah. is oh yeah, hooray! Program about soon. Um, Katrina McCook, yeah, McCook, yeah, very good. Um, I'm reading a biography of a very good biography of Annie Besant by a writer named Ann Taylor. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm reading. This is a favorite among all your viewers. Uh, the Complete Guide to Oracle and Prophecy Methods by Joseph J. Weed. He was a television executive in California who was interested in the occult. Smart guy. Um, the Influences of Lucifer and Ahriman by uh, Rudolf Steiner. Right, yeah. And uh, a Witchcraft, a very short introduction. This is a series published by Oxford University Press. And I'd like to do one of these little books one of these days. So I thought Yeah, I'd who my... wrote that one? Yeah. So that's what I happen to be reading at the moment. But at any given time, oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I feel that we need to be very anarchic in our reading tastes and never preen and try to yeah. show people that, oh, look, you know, well, what am I reading? Well, I'm you know, reading Cicero in the original Latin. And, you know, I read and, Britney Spears over Christmas. <laughs> in the original Latin. So, how was that book, by the way? It was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, she's very insightful. She's clearly been through like some therapy and self-reflection and really insightful of how like the generational abuse happened, like from her grandmother and on up, like, you know, she wasn't the first in her family to have like some man lock her up and all this. It was really interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and whenever one comes upon those interviews where some famous person is asked, what's on your nightstand right now? I always wonder if people are fully telling the truth. Uh, you know, if you saw what was on my nightstand from time to time, you know, what I, mean? <laughs> um, I, I mean, look, you know, I think that that, that we all need to be very very um joyously anarchic and guilty in our in our pleasures in our viewing like you were saying that genesis would watch ancient aliens and so forth and you know the fact is having been on that show a number of times um it's um it's actually a pretty good show you know i mean i'm not a part of or partisan towards the ancient alien thesis i've never studied it 
Um, and there are people on that show who I have lesser, lesser and, and, and greater affinities uh, for, but um, as documentary TV, it's okay. Um, you just have to be able to put up with the, the narrator coming on. It's almost become a cultural trope, you know. Could it be aliens? Well, we all agree, yes, it could be. Um, but 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 actually, some of the documentary aspects of that show are uh, are good, as TV goes. So everybody watch Ancient Aliens. That's the point yeah, that. and support our Patreons. Right, Make right. one. We have one. Support artists, for God's sake. You know, support artists. You know, my um my kids watch a lot of sports games and martial arts competitions, and not infrequently. They're pirating these things. They're pirating them through some Russian channel. And I really discourage them from doing that, even though these shows are expensive as hell. Um, that's where it starts. You know, we get into this mentality that everything is there for me for free. Everything is there for free. And uh, I know we're all pissed off with prices sometimes. Um, and yes, there's almost always some sneaky way to download something. But uh, man you know no no wage earner wants his or her work to be for free and i think that um we got to start maybe it's a matter of imbibing fewer things and paying for more whatever it is yeah. it's up to the individual but um if you don't pay for something it's going to go away yeah and if you, right, exactly, exactly. And especially yep. independent artists and publishers like if you don't want everything to be corporate then like you know Make sure you pay for the like people's music on Bandcamp or support indie publishing, et cetera. Yeah. I remember we, we actually <laughs> reported yesterday uh, oh, yeah. a, a page on uh, or a store on Etsy mm -hmm. that uh, sells uh, DVD ripped, you know, DVDs of ripped films, including uh, Anton LaVey into the Devil's Camp for $50 a, a DVD. You know, so mm -hmm. I for the first time I felt that that made me angry because that's sure. that, that is. And again, it's this is like me growing up in a way, because had you asked me 10 years ago, I would say, yeah, it's cool, you know, spread the word. But in, in the sense that film still hasn't paid its way, you know, I think it's broken even. But but um, uh, that made me angry, actually, someone ripping me off in that sense. It's worse when somebody's making money off of your art. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it's one thing, I, I, listen, I don't dig pirating. I'm against it. You know, I'm not telling anybody what to do. I don't, I don't want to catch myself doing it, mm -hmm. but to take it a step further and to profit off of somebody's book or movie or art, it's just crap. You know, it's, it's yeah. theft, theft and we're free to do it. You know, we are mm -hmm. free to do it. The guy who's doing it may live in Uzbekistan and you'll never have any way of getting to him. And no, you know, she's in doesn't... the U S it's like, a woman <laughs> in the Midwest. <laughs> no, in Maryland. <laughs> We've got your num number, honey. <laughs> the old aluminum baseball bat one night. <laughs> That's who we are. Um, it's, uh, yeah, look, everybody can do whatever the hell they, they, they want to do. But, you know, we talked earlier about honesty and the inability to allow in impressions of self. Allowing that impression for five minutes see, or for, you know, 10 seconds. You know, see how it feels. See how it feels. Mm. Well, guys, is there anything else? Carl, what are you working on now? You asked Mitch, but we should ask you too before we wrap. Uh, well, <clears throat> would you believe if I said a couple of new books? Are you writing something? <laughs> You're very, very perceptive. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's uh, business as usual, I'd say. I'm waiting for October. In October uh, is the release of my... Um, Magical Autobiography, Meetings with Remarkable Magicians, Life in the Occult Underground, uh, which we're doing the very, very final edits on now. And um, that'll be kind of a game changer because it's the first time I've written uh, about uh, my journey, basically. Uh, as um, most people uh, know, I've tended to sort of collect essays and anthologies and, you know, lectures in anthologies and and just making little uh, retrospective bags in a way. But this this um, is something else because it's a fairly chronological story of waking up to magic and then um, all the adventures, you know, people I've met, uh, things I've experienced. And um, I don't know, it's not really gossipy in any way, but there's, there's a lot of, lot of uh, meat on the bones really to chew, chew off. 
Yeah, and then then there will be a new anthology also out in the spring called uh, In Between the Lines, mm. uh, the most recent essays and lectures. And right. then there will also be uh, uh, number 12 of the Fenris Wolf. I'm working on editing that. That will be mm. out in the spring also. That will be the, the biggest one so far. I've got a question uh, from this wolves over here. Yeah, I see it that. Works. That's beautiful. Love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> and soon there will be more. <laughs> Brilliant. I'll get into more bookshelves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, so basically, uh, you know, the books, 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 and then some books. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, one of the things I'm um, pleased about is that in our digital culture, the sales of print books have held up. And yeah. this is particularly true for nonfiction, and it's particularly true for uh, spirituality, metaphysics, the occult. I find that, um, and I saw this when I worked in publishing as well, book sales are um, remain about 70% print, and then the remaining 30%, maybe 35%, gets divided between uh, digital and audio. And this is positive, it seems to me, uh, a book has posterity. It's an object of beauty. Uh, it engages the reader in a different experience. And things are are different for people who, for novelists and for genre fiction writers, like romance writers. Romance writers find almost the um, inverse ratio. And, uh, and fiction writers probably find that it's about 50-50, fiction novelists. But for nonfiction fields, especially spirituality, print has stood up with real muscularity and that's great because some of what you guys have done it, it really can't be done digitally like the book california infernal which is an archive right. of images of yeah. jane mansfield and anton levey absolutely beautiful i happen to have two copies and um and i hoard them and i i i know that 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 beautiful work could never be replicated digitally so um people seem to have reached the consensus that they they want tactile stuff. They want print physical stuff, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Let's yeah, I hope can't that read on the little computer. Yeah, yeah. I found I can't get away from it. I will not buy a digital book unless I'm in a real hurry or I just need it for research purposes. But if I really groove to something, I, I've made this decision quite recently where I thought, you know, I want to travel light. I'll still buy the book. I have a totally different experience reading the book than I do downloading the thing and and a great I think I think a good deal more retention actually yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. Well, it was so nice having you guys on likewise. likewise and like I said we'll have to have you and Jacqueline Mitch that would be fun that would be swell yeah that would be swell yeah we'll have a hangout in the next room yeah Conjuring up something, yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> and we, we can talk talk about uh, talk about movies then. That'd be swell. That'd be that would really be swell. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'll be together again soon. We're doing a program uh, in the weeks ahead. Yeah, Morbid Anatomy, yeah. March tenth. Yeah. Well, cool. Thank you, guys. Well, until the next right. time. Good to see you, Mitch. Say hi to Jack right. and we'll talk soon again. Or soon. Okay. All right. Bye. See you Bye. soon. Bye-bye.